Hey, it's Liz Kelly. Here's what's going on at The Ringer for the next couple of days. Every Sunday night on The Ringer NFL Show, Robert Mays and Kevin Clark will be breaking down everything you need to know from the full slate of games and will be ready for your Monday commute. For even more NFL content, Roger Sherman is writing about the week one NFL winners and losers. And lastly, you can read Kevin O'Connor's take on the most underrated NBA offseason editions on our site, theringer.com. You know what cheers me up when I'm feeling shitty? Rolled up aces over kings. The rewatchables. Coming up. Rounders. Right now. For the last two years, Mike McDermott has been doing the sensible thing. But his best friend just got out of jail. I can't believe you still know someone called Worm. He's like my brother. You domesticated yourself for this girl. And needs someone to lean on. I need money. I gotta put some scratch together, man. I consolidated your outstanding debt. 25 grand and still running. What I did was go partners with an old friend of yours. We do what we used to do, man. You find the games, you scout them. I sit and I mop them up. Michael McDermott. I knew you'd be back. Last night, I sat down at that table and I felt alive. My blood was bubbling, my skin was tingling. I was James Colburn in The Magnificent Seven throwing knives. Hold on there. Whoa! The guy's a cheat. Right now, he's ruining your reputation. If you don't give my money, then you are mine. I vouch for the wrong guy. Matt Damon, Edward Norton, John Turturro, John Malkovich, Gretchen Maul, Famke Janssen, and Martin Landau. Rounders. John Fantasy is here. Yes. I'm here. We've been circling this movie for a while, and there's a reason to do it. It's the 20th anniversary of Rounders, which has belatedly become one of the best sports movies. And is a slow burn movie, and the kind of has the slow burn that uh, doesn't happen anymore, but happened in the 90s a lot, where movies could kind of come and go, and people could miss them, and then they would start gaining a run, ironically, because they were rewatchable. Yeah, I think also you were very responsible for helping build some of the cult of this movie, right? You wrote about it in your column. I remember you did a Curious Guy column with Brian Koppelman and David Levine. That was wrote after the movie. it took off, though. Yeah, yeah, that was like, what, probably 06, something like that time? I did a time. movie quotes. I used to hand out movie quotes as NBA awards, and I had been at page two for less than a year. And in spring of 2002, I handed out rounders quotes. And I remember when I did it, I told my editors I was doing it and they were like rounders. Like it was one of those. It wasn't, I think I'd done Top Gun the last time I'd done Mm -hmm. like more big movies. And I was like, no rounders is, I feel like it's a thing. I feel like it's all my friends watch rounders. Like it's happening. What did it, did it have like a TBS run or was it HBO? What was it on that it made it shot it into the the jet stream of consciousness? It, It was just in the cable. You know, it's actually a really good cable movie. There's not like sex. There's not, it's not super violent. There's only some swears and that's it. Mm-hmm. So it, it's one of those things that could run on TNT, but could also run on the HBO thing. For me, I saw it on a date with my wife. I liked it. I didn't love it. I thought the poker stuff was hard to understand the first time you watched it. I also didn't know that much about poker. Yeah, we should talk about that. Yeah. And so I didn't get like all of a sudden he was up 60,000. I didn't get the Oreo tell. I just missed things. And I had this illegal cable box, lived in Charlestown, that we got from a guy named Big Al. And they would run the pay-per-views and you'd have like, you know, 20 pay-per-view channels. And each week the movies would change. And all of a sudden, so it was like channel 112, it would be rounders. And it was just on constantly. So you'd be like, oh, it's eight o'clock. Oh, I'm halfway through rounders. You would jump in. And rounders quickly became super duper rewatchable. And within about four or five, I was like, I'm in. I love this movie. I think I had a a very different experience with it because I didn't see it in theaters. I did. I was becoming obsessed with Ed Norton at that time. This Mm. is kind of right in the middle of the Ed Norton moment, but it's it comes right after Goodwill Hunting, and it was just before I went to college, so I didn't see it. Then I went to college, and like many people who live on the East Coast and go to college, I got really into poker when I got into college. Yeah, and if Rounders was on TV all the time. And the World Series of Poker was just starting to creep into the consciousness on ESPN at that point. It had been on that network for a long time. This is pre-Chris Moneymaker. Yeah. And so we're the, talking October 98. Yes. That's when the movie comes out. I'm, I'm in college about a year later, year and a half later. And 
I don't know. It just it's 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 so addictive and it's so rewarded the rewatch. Like most movies, if you rewatch them, become they become like a family member where you can kind of hear them off in the distance and you can quote the lines and it, f- it feels like nice to be around. But this is a movie that if you pay attention every time, you get a little something new. Yeah, which I think that's why they made it the way that they did. I think that's why they kind of just throw you into the lingo. They throw you into the world. That first scene, if you don't know anything about poker, if you're just Jack and Jane Doe, and you know, Mike McDee starts talking about the turn and flopping the nuts and all the phraseology that comes into the movie. You must have been so confused because yeah. they're not, they don't hold your hand in any way. And that's actually what makes it so good. Right. And that's what leads to the slow burn. When I saw it, I just didn't know a lot about poker. And on top of that, um, there hadn't been a lot of poker stuff in movies and TV. You know, you look at a movie like Maverick. Yes. Which is actually kind of an underrated movie. I love Maverick. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think it gets the credit it deserves. The Jodie Foster, the sex tension with her and Mel Gibson, I'm not sure it was there. But um, but for the most part, really good, well-written movie. William Goldman. Um, but for the most part, there just weren't a lot of poker scenes. And when you saw cards in movies, it was usually the bad guys playing cards in some kitchen. Yeah, I don't know how much you want to talk about the hands in the movie Rounders right now, but if you look at the hands that come in movies before this and even after this, and I'm obsessed with poker hands and movies. Yeah. They're all ridiculous. The Cincinnati kid is kind of one of the great poker movies of all time, but every hand in that movie is absurd. It's like, yeah. I've got four Kings. And then another guy's like, I've got four aces, you right. know, and that in Maverick, there's that great, hilarious. So over the top scene at the end between James Coburn and Alfred Molina and James Garner. And, you know, Coburn says like, I've got two pair eights and eights, you know, like everybody's got four of a kind every time. And that's just, if you play poker, that's not poker. You, I, I've had four of a kind maybe 15 times in my life, and I've played a million, two million, ten million right. hands. It just it doesn't happen that often. So this movie was one of the first times, especially the more I got into the game, you felt like even though some of it is fantastical and ridiculous, there was real attention to the specificity of the game and what it could actually be like to be in a hand. And the dialogue of it. Yes. How people talk stuff. at the table. I, I went from not playing poker ever and going to Vegas, probably starting in 94, 95 and going twice a year, maybe going to Foxwoods a couple of times to play blackjack, never even occurred to me to play poker. And within two months of rounders in the legal cable box, it became like, Hey, I'm going to go to f- tell my girlfriend, I'm going to go to Foxwoods. I'm going to be back at like four in the morning tonight. <laughs> what? To play blackjack? No, I'm going to go play poker. By yourself, like the like suspicion, like I'm cheating. <laughs> yep, I'm going. I'm going to uh, you know. I'm going to New Hampshire with some mistress I have. Um, but it just, I just wanted to play, and it's an infectious movie. I think I asked. I did a curious guy with Koppelman and Levine um, in '06 after the movie had blossomed, and it was like the poker boom. Was that the biggest reason? Um, this like Chris Moneymaker was that the biggest reason this movie belatedly took off. And he said it was that, but it was also the whole cam. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for the whole cards where before you watch poker and you could see it in the Johnny chance scene in this movie, you had no idea what the guys had. You're yes. just, they're just studying cards and you can't see, but once they put the cameras in poker became fun to watch. So that happens right as rounders is taking off. And the irony of rounders is it didn't do well. It had Matt Damon after a monster, monster movie where he's an A-plus list celebrity all of a sudden. It had Ed Norton in this really nice run that he was having as one of the best under 35 actors we had. It had John Dahl. Um, it had Gretchen Maul as like getting buzz as as like a like a little potential siren. And one of the and all-time- And Harvey Weinstein. One of the incredible supporting casts in movie history. Yeah, Malkovich. Malkovich, Turturro- Martin Landau, yeah. you know, tons of that guys all throughout the movie. It's a sports movie. It came out at the right time. It was like October. It felt like a time it should have come out. And it had the Merriam X machine at its all time yes. clout. And it just seemed like there was a lot of ads for it. It seemed like it was going to work and it didn't work. And um, I think for Koppelman and Levine, they had spent, they were the guys that wrote it. Brian Koppelman, David Levine. We have a long relationship with Koppelman, obviously. Um, they had immersed themselves in poker. They both got into it. They both played satellite tournaments. They really learned the lingo. They put all this detail and care into it. And I think they're still bitter about like Miramax just pulled the movie after three weeks. Mm -hmm. 
Um, they I, had no idea. And then belatedly it made money. And then with, by, you know, 2003, it made so much money on Blu-ray and DVD, all that stuff. Yeah. There's a case that it was five years too early, but there's also a case that it was right on time. Yeah. Like, there needed to be this stake in the ground and there needed to be this cultural touchstone for all these players who got obsessed with the game to reference. I mean, I know that Brian and David all, are fully aware of how obsessed pros became with the game and how much they talked about it. And then how much jerks like me in college were obsessed with the game and, and quoting the movie over and over. I'm still quoting that fucking movie yeah. when I'm playing home games now. It's hard to play poker and not think of scenes and lines from the movie. It really, it's almost like if every basketball movie ever made was just one basketball movie. Mm-hmm. And that like if Hoosiers was just the only basketball movie ever made, we would constantly... Uh, reference Hoosiers. Yeah, and there have been other poker movies that have been not bad. Like Lucky You came after this, and you know there were a handful yeah. of others. But like this is, this is actually bigger to poker than Hoosiers could ever be to basketball. You know that, that there just wasn't anything that was this true and useful and fun to watch. I think it came out at the perfect time, but it probably didn't feel that way at the time. And this goes back to the little slow burn thing because you saw it with Swingers, you saw it with Dazed and Confused. This would happen every year. There'd be some movie that slipped through the cracks. It would belatedly gain steam and would have this kind of word of mouth network. Have you seen it? John, actually, it happened this three years ago with John Wick. It did. I think it was like John Wick came out. It was like Keanu Reeves, whatever. It was good. And then it had a run and then it became a thing and it led to John Wick too. So I guess it can still happen. I think you're explaining the DNA of what makes a great rewatchables episode though. Because yeah. there's either Jaws, which everybody agrees is perfect and we love it and it'll be in the canon forever. But for the most part, I think the most fun movies to talk about, the most fun movies to do this show on, and some of our most popular episodes are, are movies like this. Yeah. The movies that people are like, God damn it, I have such a relationship to this movie. Yeah. This, is, this is a great one. Um, we should mention only 65 on Rotten Tomatoes. Insane. The, 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 the reviews of this movie are weird. The reviews, David Anson of Newsweek, Murdered it. Peter Travers of Rolling Stone didn't really like it. Nobody liked it. I, I, I went back and I was reading some of the reviews last night, Variety. All these people were like, eh, it's fine. It's all right. Eh. I see Disappointing. Could have been better. Weirdly, Roger Ebert. I was just going to say, I think Roger Ebert liked this movie, as I recall. Three out of four. Nice. My guy. You going to denigrate it's, him again? It's about time, Roger. <laughs> it's about time you had a good opinion. Um, and this was in a run where Damon has one of the great three movie, like just for for characters slash can I, can rewatchability I, slash um, how unique the characters were. Goodwill Hunting, Rounders, Talented Mr. Ripley. Can I give you my um, my theory on this stage of Matt Damon's career? Please. So Matt Damon is a very handsome and accomplished, young, exciting movie star. And he keeps getting cast essentially as the same guy. And this character is called Matt Damon is Lying. In all of his key roles in the beginning of his career, Goodwill Hunting, this movie, Courage Under Fire, and especially the talented Mr. Ripley, he, he's just dishonest. And it's because he's got this baby face. He's got this innocent affectation. He left out school ties, which was like school, his breakout school ties. And he's evil in school he's ties. He's evil. Um, but he, there's something like so naturally likable about him as a movie star actor that you, if you cast him as somebody who's like a little bit scummy under the surface, it, it's really effective. Yeah. And producers and directors like clearly saw this in him and kept putting him in this position to be like a little bit untrustworthy, a little bit might make the wrong choice. Like that's where the tension comes in movies. And he's been able to kind of change that over time. Something like the Martian, he's just like a good guy and we root for him. But at this stage, I love that, that Goodwill Hunting, Rounders, Talented Mr. Ripley trifecta, all Miramax movies, all handpicked by uh, Harvey Weinstein at this time. But he, they really got how to put him in a great role. What was the Grissom movie he did? Uh, Rainmaker? Yes, the Rainmaker. Yes. That was the only one where it, it just felt like he was off. It, uh, he hadn't learned how to just be Matt Damon yet. He had to have that little edge that you're talking about. And he was too pure at that time, too. I mean, that's a movie that really should have worked, right? It's, that's a Francis Ford Coppola movie. It's crazy that he was Tom Ripley and Mike McD like in the same year, basically. Yeah. And Will Hunting basically the year before that. Yeah. Those are, you know, they're, Will Hunting and Mike McD definitely could have been cousins. Some crossover. Yeah, yeah there's some crossovers. <laughs> uh, I love Mike McD. I can't think of anybody else I would have wanted as Mike McD. I think. Was anybody else on the board? I mean, it well, we'll we get always to casting go Leo versus Damon. Yeah. 
I don't know if Leo is on the board for this, but Leo as like being friends with Worm and I, I don't he can, he could not have done this in the early part of his career. Not innocent enough. There's no. always that Cheshire cat grin with Leo. You know, he always knows a little more than the other guy in the room. I don't know. Do you think Damon and Ed Norton could have switched parts? I was going to save this for probably unanswerable questions, but I'm going to just throw it out there now. Norton, 100%. At this time, I was like, Ed Norton is the new Marlon Brando. I yeah. really thought he was the most important actor who had come along in 10, 12 years. That, you, we, our opinions may have changed about that over time. Damon, no. I, don't, I think it would be fun to watch Damon be a sleazeball, but Norton is the embodiment of filth and Warm. dishonesty. You know, he's just, I don't, they're, they're, I don't think, I think actually Ed Norton is probably more irreplaceable than Damon. Directed by John Dahl. Mm-hmm. Who uh, Koppelman and Le- Levine really pursued and tried to get? Yeah, somebody who understood. I think there's like a real noir element to this movie. And yeah, John Dahl obviously gets that. Yeah. Um, I wrote that this movie actually made me start playing poker in casinos against people who are missing teeth. <laughs> that it was life altering in well, a useless just, way. That just means you're playing poker in a casino, right? The people sitting at poker tables in casinos is a grim scene. I think what I. The stuff that I like as I've now watched this movie, I it's in the hundreds. It really oh, is. It's if it's like it's been 20 years, I've seen at least chunks of it in the hundreds. I don't know if I've watched it start to finish a hundred times, but at least 30 to 40. Yeah. At least sure. twice a year. It is the definition of a rewatchable where you're flicking channels and it's on. Every every kind of section of the movie you can come into. You know, so in the beginning, oh, yeah. if it's starting, it's like Oh, cool. Mike McDee's going to lose all his money. Uh, I'm in for the full Three ride. Three stacks of high society. Let's go. If it's, oh, he's springing Worm from prison. Oh, they're going to go to that weird house and Worm's going to hit on that girl. I'm in. And now you go a little later. Oh, his girlfriend's about to move out. Let's go play some fucking cards. It's about to happen. <laughs> and it's just, it's, you can jump in. It's probably six different sections. This is, you just come in. It, this is a bold claim. I think this might be my favorite favorite movie of the last 20 years. Wow. I don't think it's the it's best up movie. There for me. I don't think it's the best movie. But it's the movie that might make me the happiest. I hadn't rewatched it in the way that I rewatched it this week in a long time, which is to say like locked in. And as I was watching it, even the stuff that is doesn't it isn't believable or it doesn't work yeah. as well. I'm sure we'll spend a lot of time on Gretchen Mall. Um I was still just so happy. It just made me so calm and excited at the same time, which is so rare. It's classic. I, so when I did the page two piece, and I at that point you you know you're feeling it out, but I was pretty convinced that I was right on this one. Sent it out in the world, and just got so many. I fucking love that movie. <laughs> yeah, Rounders! Exclamation point! And I was like, oh, okay, I was right. Yes, but I didn't I didn't know for sure. But so that I wrote that spring two thousand two. Moneymaker happened the next year, and. You know, and that by that time, Koppelman and Levine had gotten tilt and they tried to do that ESPN show. Um, that didn't work mostly because of ESPN's fault. It was just the wrong channel for it. I, th- I actually think that show could have worked. I remember you making that argument a lot that it was like that show should have been on HBO. That was like oh, a yeah. persistent note that you were giving in the world. Well, it is interesting that nobody has tried to do Rounders, the TV show, since. I bet they've been offered. I wouldn't be shocked if I'm they I'm not even saying with Koppelman and Levine, like do it wherever. A but poker I, show? I think the stuff I like the most about this movie after watching it a million times is, you know, like when they go to uh, Atlantic City and they show up at the table and all the dudes from Chesterfield are there. And Dan's like, oh, welcome to the Chesterfield South. <laughs> and it's all those little nuances of just these fucking losers that are just really good at this one thing and they know how to run a game and they have like respect for each other. They don't really want to take each other's money. Let's just basically molest the tourists and take their money. It's a little like working at the ringer. Yeah, <laughs> um, there's a lot to go through here. We should probably we should probably hit the categories because um, there's just a lot going on. There's so much. I, I, I literally just copy and pasted the entire page of quotations from this movie because I <laughs> couldn't did not pick stuff. It, it does have about as many quotes as we've had for. We haven't done some of the classics yet. This movie has is is up there for classics. Just you can rip off 25 quotes. Let's do one break and we'll come back with the categories. Do you find yourself distracted, forgetting things, making mistakes at work? A quality night's sleep makes all the difference. The right mattress is the difference between resting and just laying down. The Lisa mattress, the product of more than 30 years of experience in mattress engineering and hundreds of hours of testing, 
comprised of three foam layers that provide cooling, pressure relief, body contouring, and support. Over 300,000 happy Lisa sleepers agree. Lisa gives them the rest they need. All you have to do is you get up to $160 off the Lisa mattress or $235 off the luxury Sapira mattress and free shipping on the Lisa mattress. Here's what you do. Go to lisa.com slash rewatchables. Ships direct to your door in a convenient box with free shipping and free returns. Enter promo code rewatchables at checkout and you're done. Lisa.com slash rewatchables. Promo code rewatchables. L E E S A dot com. All right, the most rewatchable scene of Rounders. I have five. The opening scene Mike McD loses his shirt. I'm going to go on because I don't think you have the spades. You're right. I don't have the spades. I need to discuss that scene with you. Okay. Number two, Mike McD's poker comeback. Let's just play that because it's just fucking unbelievable. You know what cheers me up when I'm feeling shitty? What? Rolled up aces over kings. Is that right? Yeah. Check raising stupid tourists and taking huge pots off them. Yeah? Stacks and towers of checks I can't even see over. Playing all night, high limit, hold them at the Taj, where the sand turns to gold. Fuck it, let's go. Don't tease me. Let's play some fucking cards. Let's play some fucking cards. Gets me so fired up. Same. The guitar riff. I'm just like, I'm so ready to gamble. It's like in Swingers when they're when they're about to hit Vegas. Like, hey man, Vegas! Vegas! You know what the thing is though? It, it's a little bit of a of a cheat. And you know, because you and I played cards on the same night earlier this summer. Yeah. And I think you remembered what it's actually like to it's play so cards. Bad. It's so slow. It's slow and, and awful. And the people are terrible. You're all Joe. You're everyone's Joey Kanish. No one's Mike McD. No, you know, no, everyone has to grind to make a little bit of money and have, and have even a modicum of fun. But this movie makes it sound like you get in a jet engine and you fly down the tarmac and, and you, you know, every hand is four Kings it, versus it, the full house. Exactly. It's just not that way. Yeah. Um, when, I, when we played poker, you just put your AirPods in yes. and you and don't interact with everyone. My favorite thing to do, my favorite thing to do in my life is to get in my car, drive all the way to Vegas, and then just sit at a poker table for eight hours, not talk to anybody and play. That yeah. is the most common thing I can do. Wow. All right. So that's second, the Johnny Chan scene, which I didn't know any poker players. I kind of remember Doyle Brunson. Didn't know anyone else. And then Johnny Chan, who's one of the big winners of this movie. 100%. That scene's amazing. Um, everything about it's awesome. I love the fact that the the Russian lady has just intimate familiarity with, with World Series poker The hand poker between highlights. Chan and Seidel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, look at the patience. <laughs> uh, that's a classic. I'm sorry, John. I don't remember. Yeah, one right. of the amazing classic. Lines. Mike and Worm trying to win everything back. Yep. I've gone on runs like this before. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the final scene, Mike McDee versus Teddy KGB. Those are five fairly iconic to legitimately iconic rewatchable scenes. What is the most rewatchable scene in this movie, Sean Fantasy? Couple of um, runner-up nominations. Yeah. The Judges Game. I love the Judges Game. Yeah. Uh, just Mike McDee putting people on hands. Every movie like this needs a moment to show you how smart the lead character is. Yep. This is a perfect example of just like when he points out the hands of every single judge in the room and then Judge Marinacci is like willing to give him a clerkship because he put him on one hand in one game of, I don't even know what they're playing, high-low stud maybe in that room. And then the other nomination is um, the scariest scene, but I think one of the best made scenes in the movie, which is the trip to Binghamton and the card game with the, with oh, the yeah. police officers. The municipal workers. Yeah, that's a really... The, the, that shot of them getting their ass kicked after they've been caught when uh, you know Norton's doing the mechanic stuff is pretty amazing stuff. Really cool, like really tension filled. In a movie that like the stakes are always kind of up and down, you don't really know like how dangerous is grandma? What yeah. is K KGB really going to do? In that scene when those cops are kicking the shit out of them, that's really good. Um, my favorite scene, the most rewatchable scene I think is the opening scene because I think it's, it's a testament to it drawing you in. And... I love the, the the soundtrack and I love Mike McD rolling in with 30 grand and and getting the three stacks of high society and sitting down to play and starting to explain the game and the kind of nuances of the game. You know, voiceover has become like a real no-no in movies over the last 20 I, you years. You know where I stand. I hate voiceover. But in this movie, it really works. It's really effective. And he's voicing over the first 10 minutes of the movie, basically. I have one quibble and I'm, I'm going to go into it right now. That final hand between him and KGB in the opening scene, 
Mike McDee is holding ace nine. KGB, of course, we know is holding aces. The board comes down, and I think it's ace nine eight. And then another eight comes, or excuse me, another nine comes, giving Mike his his full boat. Also giving KGB his boat. And then there's a rag on the river. KGB is so sure of himself that he's won that he just shows Mike his aces, drops the cards on the table, and walks away. But there's a chance that Mike McDee could have been holding pocket nines, giving him four nines, beating KGB's boat. I've never heard anybody talk about this. You're talking, this is the opening scene. The opening scene. how, how, How did KGB... He was so sure that his boat was better than Mike McDee's boat, but he, Mike McDee could have had a strike. It's just one of those very random card things. You should I'm have like, saved this for picking this. I, I, I just, I can't get it out of my head since it's happened. It's like, if Mike McDee had four nines, then what happens? KGB has to like come back to the table and it's awkward. I, it, that just, it's, that's the only thing about the movie that really bugs me. He just looked at his face. Mike McDee's face? Yes, yeah, he's just devastated. Yeah, he read his holds face. holds up those aces. He doesn't need to see anything else. He read his face. That's what I thought. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. I I would still want to see the cards. My favorite scene, the most rewatchable scene for me, is Gretchen Mall moves out of the apartment. (laughs) But not the moving out part, just when when they get to the apartment. All the stuff's gone. Ed Norton does the woman or the fucking rake speech. Yes. And then Mike McDee's wheels are turning, leading to, fuck it, let's go. Let's play some fucking cards. The music... It gets me so fired up. It's great. It's like, almost like a sports movie scene. That's my favorite scene. I love all these scenes, though. What's age the best? I don't know if this is the greatest opening line in movie history, but it's certainly one of the most memorable. Mm-hmm. I don't. I would like to see that list. What's the greatest opening line in the history of movies? The first line of this movie is, listen, here's the thing. If you can't spot the sucker in your first half hour at the table, then you are the sucker. It's great. Fucking great way to open a movie. So good. I don't know what it, what is the best opening line in the history of movies. Jeez, that that list has to exist on the internet somewhere. I don't know. That's a really good. It's question. a really good one. Maybe that this sounds like a column you can work on over oh, your geez. vacation. Thanks, Bill. Uh, another thing that's what's age the best. And the, so again, the category is what's age the best. So as the years go on, how has that helped this movie? There's billions DNA in this. We all have billions at the ringer. Mm -hmm. And you watch Rounders and it's almost like watching Tracy McGrady and the Raptors. (laughs) You're like, oh, yeah. Oh, remember Jay T-Mac? Yeah, I felt like that was going to keep going for those guys. So what what are the the billions aspects? The pop culture references that I felt like Buckner going into Shea. Yeah. All those like little subtle throwaway lines that became kind of one of the reasons we love billions. Signatures, yeah. feel it, yeah. And then Malkovich, too, obviously, in, in season three. The Malkovich, yeah. Uh, you just mentioned that scene when, when Mike McDee loses the 30K, the Mike McDermott face. I think the face he makes is one of the best acting moments of Damon's career. The, I fucking just lost my shirt. That is the face everyone makes when they get destroyed in poker or blackjack or, you know, you split, you've split... Uh, six sevens and you just have all your blackjack money on the table and then the dealer deals themselves the six card 21 and you just the life sinks out of your body and you're just in shock the, it's a great face in poker in particular i'm not a big blackjack person but in poker in particular that feeling when you hit a big hand and you're so deluded with euphoria about hitting the hand you don't realize there's a better hand out there yeah and then when you see that it's been cracked is is the most crushing, non-important thing that can happen to you in life. It sucks so much. I hate that feeling. So I totally identify with that. Well, there's a sports fan element of that where, you know, like if Marco Bellinelli had made the three in the corner against the Celtics (laughs) and instead of it counting as a two, like those, or like the Case Keenum pass. And that's when you make the Mike McDee face. Yes. The Mike McDee face is a face. All the throwaway poker lines have aged beautifully. I just love all of them. The flop, the nut, the, all that shit. It's just great. And I feel like I actually understand the lingo partly because of this movie. Yep. And then uh, the final what's age the best for me, Damon and Norton at really fun times of their careers. We, we mentioned the Damon movies. Norton and, you know, basically arrives with Primal Fear. He does American History X, which is one of the most interesting um, actor performances of the last 25 years. Quite a period. movie to go back to now, too. It's yeah. really, it's got some and interesting he's tension. Like, 
uh, he transformed himself in a lot of different ways and has never really been that guy again in a movie. I guess 25th Hour is a combo of that guy, a touch of that guy with a lot of worm crossed with some life experience. So he does those two. He has Rounders and then he has Fight Club, which is another one of the most interesting movies the last 25 years. Those are four like OGs. There's two others that you, you skip in there too. There's Everyone Says I Love You, which is he second movie. He works with Woody Allen on yeah. a terrible musical. And then The People versus Larry Flint. And I think he was nominated for an Oscar for that. So that movie hasn't aged well. I haven't seen it He's in a long good time. in it though. I like, I, I remember liking it. I remember liking it. Yeah. And it's actually that movie kind of set the template because the two guys who wrote that, I think Larry Krasuski and Scott Alexander are their names. Um, those are the guys who wrote OJ, the OJ Ryan Murphy show. And they wrote Ed Wood and they wrote all these biopics over the years. And that has become like a, a replicable thing on TV now. And Larry Flint was one of the first movies to do it in that style, that like big picture, like clever, fun, but controversial biopic story. Man in the Moon was like that. Yeah, they, there similar. was this yeah, biopic I think they wrote run. that too. Yeah, yeah, those movies don't, they don't really make those movies anymore. Yeah, they're, they're I don't TV think they shows. make money. Yeah. yeah. Or their um, 13 episode things. It made me think though, that Damon Norton, the point of their careers they're in. For, and this happens with like basketball too. You just have these talent kind of clusters and you go back and you think about 96, 97, 98. You just had a lot of great fucking actors. Yes. You, from, yeah, I would say if you're doing the fantasy draft, I think Leo, Damon, and Norton are probably the top three or, or three of the top five, but you also had Brad Pitt in there. Yeah, Affleck is obviously You had the Affleck, same time. who I think kind of gravitated toward these big picture popcorn movies right away and, and wasn't really ready to explore the acting part. But, um, and then uh, you had like, you had like the school ties and you had, um, Dazed and Confused. You had these big feeder movies. You had Vince Vaughn sitting there. Nobody knew what kind yeah. of career he was going to have. I don't know. It was just this really fertile time for this movies. Is, Weirdly, no black actors. It was all white actors. I don't know why. I'm no no black actors who really like went to the stratosphere. No, I mean, Halle Berry, I guess, at this time. Starts yeah, I'm just talking about actors. Yeah, I mean, Clooney too. Clooney in the mid George to late Clooney, 90s is really when he gets really famous. I mean, the, and then just, I would have, I, by the way, if we were doing this 20 years ago, I would have said Matthew Perry was going to be in there. Yeah. I mean, there were there were some others. Wahlberg emerges at this time. Wahlberg starts. Will Smith. I think this is right when Will Smith really takes off. Oh, there you go. Will Smith. Will Smith. Perfect. Uh, but uh, you're, you're, Yeah, Wahlberg had Boogie Nights. Yep. And then, um, God, there's one more in there you made me think of. Uh, uh, TV. Matthew Perry. Uh, oh, Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey, yeah. It was a... This is when I would say that's one of the best talent clusters we had because all those guys are like 35 and under, basically. They, yeah. I mean, if you're talking like 93 to 99. Yeah. Um, Because you think about like The Godfather, where Brando and Pacino and those guys have talked about it, where they're Pacino, James Caan, Duvall, yep. John Cazale, they're all on the set and they'll idolize Brando. And they have this whole budding generation, De Niro's part of it, and then that becomes a generation. Right. I don't think we think of the 90s that way, but we just had a lot of dudes that went on to stuff. I think a lot of those people don't get, a lot of the people that we're talking about don't get credit as actors, they get credit as movie stars. And this is when the movie star system kind of came roaring back. Yeah. And it was like the cover of Entertainment Weekly was the most important place to be. And that this was when Jim Carrey was getting $20 million a movie. And that was a huge story. And people like, the, the system was still built to make somebody like Matt Damon succeed. Yeah. And he really went for it and got it. Ed Norton took a little bit of a left turn. Ed Norton always made interesting, odd choices. Like he cho- right after he makes uh, that, that little string of movies in the mid 90s, he directs his first movie, Keeping the Faith, which is kind of a strange comedy about religion that a lot of people like, including uh, the ringers, Juliette Littman. But like, I, don't, I didn't love. And he makes the score, this weird heist movie with De Niro and Death to Smoochie and, and then 25th Hour. And you know, 25th Hour was probably the best movie he made of the 2000s. I agree. It's one of but my, that's one of my favorite like, movies. I felt like he had five or six of those. Yeah. Yeah. And, he, had, um, he had some good ones. I don't ones. know what happened. The Illusionist. That was a cool movie. I like The Illusionist. Yeah. But he, he never really, he never really had the Al Pacino or like Gene Hackman career that I wanted him to have. Yeah. Um, and maybe he still will. He's obviously still working and making movies. Well, but. What's fun about Worm is just, it's such a unique to him character. I don't know how many people could have done it. It's almost out of the John Cazale 1970s where kind of this lovable scumbag. Like I feel like John Cazale could have done that, right? There's oh, yeah. certain actors who 
it's like that guy's scum, but I, I, I'm rooting for him and I'm yeah. not positive why. There's a little Fredo and Worm. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anything else aged the best for you? I think the movie like looks surprisingly cool and not dated for 1998. Yeah. It's also a pretty good New York movie. I was I found myself trying to figure out. Oh, that's out, good. I like that New York age the best. Yeah, like it, it, it still looks like in the New York that I remember, that I think of when I think of it. I found myself trying to place places as I was watching it and what was real and what wasn't real. And, you know, the, the Chesterfield is obviously um, based on a club, I think called the Mayfair. Yeah. That those guys used to play at all the time. And I was only in a room like that one time when I was living in New York, but it is what that room looked like. It was like a slightly nicer red leather version of the room, the, pri- the private room that I played in. And so it just, it kind of has like that seedy, but exciting New York City feeling. I think one more thing I forgot to mention was Russians as villains has aged the best. <laughs> think That's about really like good. 1998, the Cold War had been ended eight years earlier. Russia was in a free fall in a lot of ways. But now in the last 20 years, Russia, much more villainous, yeah. much more believable that you know, you have these dudes, this underground network. Oh, yeah. A little more villainous. Roman and Maurice and Teddy KGB and oh, the yeah. whole group. What's age the worst? Gretchen Maul is the stereotypical wet blanket girlfriend. This was a staple in the 80s and 90s, especially in sports movies, of uh, one of the ways to kind of undermine a character or give him some tension. You just had a girlfriend or a wife who didn't believe in what he was doing, basically. Yes. So you start there. I had my Mount Rushmore for wet blanket girlfriends was... Adrian Balboa and Rocky IV mm-hmm. just quits on him. Doesn't even go to Russia. She'd been through a lot. It's bullshit. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm not I'm, worried about Adrian. I, I'm still in go fuck yourself Adrian mode. Like doesn't even, shows up belatedly in Russia and I'm supposed to be excited. Like you should have gone with him. It's your husband. He's going to fight Drago. What are you doing? Okay. Uh, Myra Fleener and Hoosiers. Yeah, this is the number one. Incredible wet blanket. I wrote a whole ESP in the magazine column way back when about uh, just how awful she was in that movie. And I have no idea why Gene Hackman liked her. Unless I, she was like sneaky hot in person. I don't know if this is necessarily a problem of rounders, but, and I, I have read you writing about this for many years. I think it's just because a lot of men don't know how to write female characters. Yeah. So they what they do is they take their own anxieties and frustrations in their own marriages or their own relationships or the things that bother them about women and then they use that as a way to create the tension in their character and be like, this is the person who's really holding you back. Right. And it's like, that's just, I, whether that's true or not for people, it kind of doesn't matter, but it is why I think you get all these, these female characters that you're just like, what is this woman doing in this movie? The last member of the Mount Rushmore is Ned Braden's wife in Slapshot, which is a 40 plus year movie, but uh, yeah. tough hang. Even like kind of throws it at Paul Newman in one scene. So here's the defense for Koppelman and Levine. Yeah. And they revealed this in the in the rounders back and forth I did with them. Originally, Damon's girlfriend was only supposed to be in three scenes. Hmm. And he had this, they had this other character that they wrote called Atkinson, who was Mike's best friend from law school. He was a counterpoint to Worm, kind of the alternate path for where, where Worm could go, a friend he could count on. Um, the studio made them combine Joe and Atkinson and basically boost up the Joe character to give her more scenes. And at that point, it's like, well, she's not essential to the movie at all. She's just kind of in Worm's way. And that's how you knew up with Joe. Um, Not a great performance by Gretchen Moll either, but she she rallied in the 2000s. Yeah. Fortunately, but she is just flat out bad in this movie and not likable. Tricky to discuss. This was around the time of the famous Vanity Fair cover where she was deemed like the next new ingenue. I think at that point. And everybody's like, what? And it was like, who is this? I think she had maybe only made like Donnie Brasco at this point. Yeah. Um, She, she isn't, she isn't very good. She just isn't. It's the only time in the movie where I'm like, what is happening? This movie has lost its rhythm. Yeah. Um, So it's, that just has an age. They fight through it. Uh, Another thing that's what's aged the worst, the card scene with the judges, which we both really like. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm just not convinced Mike McDee can stand there for 14 seconds and read everyone's hand. I know people are brilliant. Koppelman and Levine defend it. They claim they've seen it happen. Um, let's hear that scene. <laughs> the fuck you know what we all got? Summer clerkship in your office says I know what you're holding. I don't bet with jobs like that. Let's just say I'll put you at the top of the list if you're right. Okay. <clears throat> well... You were looking for that third three, but you forgot that Professor Green folded it on 4th Street, and now you're representing that you have it. 
Um, the DA made his two pair, but he knows they're no good. Judge Kaplan was trying to squeeze out a diamond flush, but he came up short, and Mr. Eisen is futilely hoping that his queens are going to stand up. So, like I said, the dean's bet is $20. Well, kiss my ass. <laughs> kiss my ass. All right, so again, he's stayed in there for maybe 8 to 14 seconds. I'm just not buying it. I've seen people do stuff like this, but never exactly this. And after studying everybody for five to seven hours, not 14 yes. seconds. Yes. Usually you need more time. Um, it does set up that he's a savant. I can't figure out what game they're playing there, though. I'm sure somebody who knows more about games that are not, because they're not playing Texas Hold'em. They're playing, like I said, Oklahoma or seven card stud. Some game where there's a lot of cards on the table. And so based on the number of cards on the table, you have a better sense of being able to say, this is what this person needs to be successful. The other thing is we never see the judge's card. So maybe he got a couple of things wrong, but we don't actually know. It just seems like he got everything right. It's, it's a reach. I'm fine with it. Okay. Martin Lando's character I described as a cross between a law school professor, Professor Confucius, the fairy godmother, and Red Arbeck. <laughs> that sounds right. I agree. <laughs> It's not, not a great character, but also is essential. Needs to be in it. I didn't he only has a couple scenes. I didn't nominate this for most rewatchable scene, but I do love the scene where he tells him the story of leaving the yeshiva. Which time? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Which time when he tells the story? When he meets him at the bar and he pour, he's pouring him gin, always gin. Yeah. I, I, I really like that scene a lot. Um, you know... Movies like this need an old guy. You always used to say that about Granlin. You, you need an old guy. Yeah. And, and like this movie. Charlie really, Pierce was our old guy. He was, yeah. Yeah. I remember when he left the yeshiva. <laughs> Mike McD not hooking up with Famke Jansen is the biggest flaw, not only of this movie, but maybe of my life. I, I've been waiting for this. His girlfriend moves out. I've confronted Koppelman and Levine <laughs> about it multiple times. His girlfriend moves out. He's got nothing going on. He's just in his apartment. He, she comes over because the worms run up a tab. He's fucking home watching some old world series of poker. And she, and she makes a hard pass at him. And, and he's just like, now maybe now's not the time. It's inexplicable. It's, it's indefensible. And I hate it. You know, you know the whole theory of the manic pixie dream girl, right? That came out after Penny Lane and almost famous and a lot of movies that Zoe Deschanel made in the mm. early 2000s. This like, beautiful, sweet, interested in you, imaginary char female character in a movie who just like is too good to be true that there were a lot of them in this like five to 10 year period. Famke Jansen's character in this movie is the manic poker dream girl. She is like everything that guys that are obsessed with poker want. She's beautiful. Three years removed. A beautiful, from, crazy Russian. Yes. Removed from being a Bond girl. She just yeah. was a Bond girl in one of the Pierce Brosnan movies. She loves poker so much that not only does she work at the Chesterfield, but as you said earlier, she can recount hands from the World Series. She's 10 like, oh, years you're watching Johnny Chin. Which is this was not even on TV. And all she wants to do is hang out, have sex, probably drink, and play cards. Yeah. And that's what who that's who Mike McDee is. That's what he wants to do. Now, the case against that, obviously, is that one, he loves Joe, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, Two, not really. He's trying to change his life. He's trying to go straight. And Petra, it seems like they had a relationship of some kind before this. And she represents the old version of him. And he doesn't want to go back. I, whether that is a good choice, even just for that one night, is maybe not for me to say. It's it, Rewatching the movie, it's like, they should just, they should just fuck. Like, I don't I don't. <laughs> what's the downside here? Koppelman and Levine admit it's their biggest mistake in the movie. Great. Maybe they could CGI a sex scene in there for the 25th anniversary. Maybe for the reunion, yeah. The uh, That to me is the what's age the worst, actually. I, I just can't buy any explanation for them not hooking up. Your explanation, it's fine. You put some thought into it. I no. did, I did. No, I think he's like, fuck it, I'm having sex with him. Okay, okay. She's too good looking. She's beautiful. I love Fancy Jackson. Great job by her in this yeah. movie. Casting what ifs. I only have one. Nev Campbell turned down the role of Joe. That's all I got for you. I looked for other stuff, but it seems like they were locked in on Damon and Norton the whole time. And there's not a lot of, oh, this almost happened stuff with this movie. Movie would have worked better with Nev Campbell. Just, I, I agree. Just a better actress. Better actress and a really nice point of her career. Yeah. 
Party Five still cruising post Scream. She's inherently sympathetic, which is what you need Joe to be. You have to believe that she's trying with Mike McD to make, to get him to go straight. You have to care about her point of view. And with Nev Campbell, you probably would have. Yeah. The Deanne Waiters Award, it's just loaded this year <laughs> for this movie. It's sometimes that Deanne Waiters is a hit or miss. The biggest heat check in the movie. John Malkovich is Teddy KGB. Yep. Famke Jansen. John Turturro is Kanish. Martin Landau with only three scenes. He's not going to win, but it has to be mentioned. And uh, and the guy who played Grandma, Michael Rispoli, who we're going to get to with the Joey Pants Award. Um, there's only one answer here. Yeah, there's only one answer. I don't pay this man his fucking yeah, money. It's, Come on, it's, it's it's KGB. He's in three scenes. He's in the opening scene. He's in the closing scene. I think that's is, it. Is that it? I think that's it. Incredible. So for NBA box score, it's 12 minutes <laughs> and he has 35 points. Yep. And I think he has 10 rebounds and seven box shots. Shout out to Famke Jansen though. I love her. She's great. You could make a case she should have just been Joe and they just should have figured out another you know, Russian character. I don't think we should overlook Kanish either. Kanish has got some of the greatest lines in the movie. He represents, I think, what real poker players, a lot of lifetime kind of poker players are like. Keep grinding out that rent money, Kanish. Grinding out that rent money. Um, The tension between him and Worm is awesome. He's based on this real guy who Koppelman and Levine wrote about in 2014 named Joel Bagels, who was a guy who was clearly like a a valet for those two guys when they were getting obsessed with poker and then started writing the movie. It sounds like a lot of the lines, women are the rake, is, is his real, is Joel Bagels real life line. And... I don't know, Kanish is a great character. That confrontation between um, Kanish and Mike McD at the sauna when he won't give him the money. I love that scene so much. Yeah. The stuff they say to each other. Can we hear that actually, Zach? If I give you two grand, what's that buy you? A day? Nah, I give it to you. I'm wasting it. That's fucking great. Hey, you did it to yourself. You had to put it all on the line for some Vegas pipe dream. Hey, I took a risk. I took a risk. You, you see all the angles. You never have the fucking stones to play one. Stones? You little punk. I'm not playing for the thrill of fucking victory here. I will rent, alimony, child support. I play for money. My kids eat. I got stones enough not to chase cards, actions, or fucking pipe dreams of winning the World Series on the ESPN. You want me to call some people? Try and buy you some time, I will. Place to stay or the truck? No problem. But about the money, I gotta do this. I gotta say no. I like Kanish. I almost feel like it's not a heat check because he's in too many scenes. Yeah, that's fair. Demalkovich is in two scenes, maybe two and a half. He's the and ultimate it's a Dion fucking heat check. Joey Pants Award, a lot of nominees, a lot of that guy's um, just in the random poker scenes. But shout out to Lenny Clark, who's now, I think people know it's Lenny Clark, but back then he was just this guy you only knew if you lived in Boston. And he's in one of the poker scenes, has a couple lines. That one was good. And then uh, Michael Raspoli as grandma. I, I got to be honest. I think I'm in the 99th percentile with this stuff. I didn't know that his name was Michael Raspoli until I looked it up and then did more research. And it was like, this was the guy who lost the bake-off to James Gandolfini That's for Tony the, Soprano. the key Raspoli fact. Yeah. Unfortunately- and I didn't put it all together that grandma lost to Tony Soprano to Gandolfini. That's it. It's, uh, it's an amazing what if. And he went on to be Jackie Aprile in the show. He still had a big role in the show. The that really is a important part. Consolation prize. It truly, I mean, his, that, that guy's life probably would have been completely different. He's a good actor. Grandma's a weird character though. Not sure. Uh, not sure what his deal was with Teddy. What was his arrangement with Teddy KGB? There's some questions. I can't understand really though, how the money stuff works at the end. Like is grandma supposed to be upset? Whose money did he lose? Like did Mike McD walk away yeah, with his money? Why was grandma or? upset if he's getting his money anyway? Yeah. He got paid off. I, I, I couldn't figure any of that stuff out. I also the whole, listen, I don't know a lot about the, uh, the underworld. But the whole, I took the guy's juice and now it's this. It just seems completely arbitrary. Yes. <laughs> it's like, hey, you owe me 15K? It's like, why? Is there some is there some formula that we have to abide by? The numbers shift around a little bit on how much Worm owes to. I, I'll wait for nitpicks on this one. Okay. Half fast internet research mentioned that in the original draft, Joe is only in three scenes. All law school scenes filmed at Rutgers University. Oh, interesting. My I, In my head, I thought it was John Jay that was what it was based on. I think they call it like City Law School or something yeah. in the name of the school. 
Malkovich acquired his convincing accent by having a Russian woman read all of his lines first and then mimicked her accent. Let me ask you this. Is it convincing, though? Well, I'm just reading what was in the internet research. (laughs) Okay. In the original version of the script, Mike McDermott was going to make a move on Phil Hellmuth. Oh, my God. In the Atlantic City big money game, not Johnny Chan. Thank the motherfucking Lord. I never heard that before. Yeah, thank God. You hate Hellmuth. I don't hate Hellmuth. I just think, I'm so glad it was Johnny Chan. Hellmuth is one of the great characters in sports history, in my opinion. One of the great figures in the history of all sports. He's certainly polarizing. It's like Skip Bayless cross with poker. I, I live for guys like that, not because I like him, or think he's a good man. I do think he's a good poker player. You're just player. glad he exists. It's amazing he exists. Yeah. He makes poker so much more interesting. To this day, he's still, at the World Series this year, he pulled some wild bullshit where he called a guy out for no reason. Like, that's great that that's happening. That kind of drama yeah. is good. I'm pro with you too, and I find him annoying. Um, I think Johnny Chan is just one of the biggest winners of this movie. When we do Who Won the Movie, he's like in the top four. Yes. He Because he won the World Series of Poker during a time nobody gave a shit. Twice. His, twice. His name is incredible. It's like the perfect poker name. We could you could you, we could sit in a fucking log cabin in the middle of nowhere in Minnesota <laughs> for a year and not come up with Johnny Chan as yep. a poker name. It's so good. One, Johnny Chan. Poker is a sport full of people with amazing names and amazing nicknames. So that's yeah. that's part of it. But two, you're right. He's like the Muhammad Ali of boxing. He uh, he like stands alone in the poker world. With because this. of this movie. Yeah. And if they make the movie 10 years later, it's Phil Ivey. Yes, and Phil Ivey sure. gets this Johnny Chan spot. One hundred. Who's the guy who loses to him? Eric. Uh, Eric, Eric Seidel. Eric Seidel. One of the absolute greatest poker players of all time. Huge Seidel's loser. Still playing professionally. Still making shitloads of money in cash games. I don't care. But he looks like a fucking yokel yeah. in this movie because Johnny Chan in pulls movie. his pants down. He must hate this movie so much. He must. Seidel is. Hey man, Cyan Runners. He's just like his teeth are gristling. A Counting Crow song at the end, not on any album. Not even on Spotify. I think we know how Koppelman feels about Counting Crows. Baby, I'm a Big Star Now, which is actually a good song. I was making uh, a Counting Crows Spotify playlist because we're coming up on 25 years. I want to have Adam Duritz on my pod, actually, and just dive into some of these songs. Let's go. You're going to tease that right now? Yeah. He's invited. Come on anytime, Adam Duritz. Sweet. Baby, I'm a Big Star Now. Really no record of it anywhere. It's on YouTube. I'm looking at it on Spotify. It's on Spotify? Yeah. It's Where? On, it's on Saturday nights and Sunday mornings. Oh, I'm just terrible. I can't find stuff. Well, anyway, it never made a Counting Crows album, and it's one of the best 20 songs they've made. It's a good, nice little ending. Great song. Uh, I like the double meaning of Baby, I'm a Big Star Now. Oh, yeah. Matt Damon and Edward Norton played the $10,000 buy-in Texas Hold'em championship event at the 98 World Series of Poker in Vegas. Matt Damon at Pocket Kings was knocked out by Pocket Aces, by Doyle Brinson. No kidding. Is that a true story? It's half-assed internet research. It's on the internet. Wow. Yeah. For those of you who don't, one of the great little tidbits. Doyle Brinson's like the Bill Russell of yes. poker. One of the greatest players of all time. One of the most famous hands of all time. 210 is the Doyle Brunson. Um, in the opening shots of the movie, I think when we're seeing Mike McDee's house, when he's pulling the money out of kind of all of the safe spaces he's found, um, one of the places he pulls it out of is a book, and that book is Doyle Brunson's Super System, yeah. which is a book I read when I was 18 and devoured and probably doesn't make as much sense for poker strategy, but is a really cool thing if people are looking to learn more about poker. Brunson writes about it really well. You know my rule. If you have something named after you, you've done something well. He's a, <laughs> he's a poker player who has a hand named after he, him. But he won the World Series of Poker with 210. Yeah. Which is amazing. Not one of my favorite hands. No. Let's take terrible. one more break. Let's talk about all the great Ringer Podcast Network stuff we have coming this month. Football heating up. Ringer NFL show five times a week. Ryan Rossillo every Tuesday night. Dual threat. College football and pro football. Against all odds with Cousin Sal. Gambling stuff on Wednesday. If you like gambling, if you like rounders, if you like poker, that's happening. We have the Ringer MLB show heating up with the baseball playoffs coming. We have the Ringer NBA show is back. We have a bunch of pop culture stuff ranging from Larry Wilmore to Dave Chang show to House of Carbs to The Watch to all the great stuff on Channel 33 to Binge Mode Harry Potter. And we also have our music podcast on Shuffle, which I went on last week to tell the kids to get off my lawn. 
We have a slew of podcasts. You can check them all out on the ringer.com slash podcasts or on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. Just put in Ringer. Things will come up. Don't forget about my podcast too, the Bill Simmons podcast. Three times a week. So yeah, we love doing the rewatchables, but we have other great stuff for you to listen to as well. Check it out. All right, we're back. Apex Mountain. I'm excited for this one. Yes. Matt Damon, obviously not. No. Because the movie wasn't a hit. It no. did make me wonder what Matt Damon's Apex Mountain really was. Did we do this in the Goodwill Hunting episode? I can't remember. It's interesting. I, I, I think... Probably that first Bourne movie that just makes a shitload of money yeah. and establishes himself as the A-plus franchise, whatever. That's a good call. Yeah. Ed Norton. Um, I don't think this was his apex mount. I think Fight Club was because at that point he'd had a body of work and Rodgers was getting some buzz, but we're close. Yes. He's on his way up the mountain. Also agree with that. Gretchen Maul, definitely not. No, probably the notorious Betty Page for Gretchen Maul. That was her big comeback. Johnny Chan, 100% yes. No way. 100% yes. Johnny Chan so won ready. two World Series of Poker but this in was, a row. This was this was his third title, basically. <laughs> sure. He wins two, and now he's immortalized forever in this movie as pulling the greatest poker move. Look at the patience. <laughs> Look at him wait out his guy. Oh, my God. It's like, what's better than that? Doesn't he have the exact same hand that that Mike sucks out Kenny G, uh, Teddy KGB with? Isn't I think he the, might. Isn't it the yeah. wheel? John Turturro, no. I don't know what John Turturro's Apex Mountain is. This is a great character, though. I think this is the same year that he does it's the, big, be some the Big Lebowski, Lebowski too. Yeah. He's Jesus, which yeah. is pretty incredible. That's a, quite a one-two punch. as like Because he's one of the great supporting actors of all time. So. Maybe that's his. Maybe the Rounders-Lebowski uh, combo. It's probably Barton Fink is probably his Apex Mountain. You know, That's mm. a few years before that. It's an iconic movie. He's the star. You're not a Barton Fink guy. Malkovich, Dan- I'm not a Coen Brothers guy. Malkovich, Dangerous Liaisons was his apex mountain. Wow. Yeah. Fuck yeah. Not I'll, Con I'll Air? Fight. No, I'll fight anyone who thinks otherwise. Because it had come off Killing Fields. <laughs> You'll fight anyone. He's great in Killing Fields. He's like uh-huh. really, really, and I, that movie's a little dated, but it's still pretty powerful. Yep. I haven't seen that. In and he's awesome years. in it. He, his character is fucking great in that movie. But And then he has this nice run. And then Dangerous Liaisons, him and Glenn Close, they are so over the top. And he's so, I, I I don't feel like that performance gets enough credit. It's a fun movie. It's a really fun movie. Yeah. It's, it's actually, it's never on either. I would, I would watch it right now if it was on. Anybody else, Apex, what do, what do you think his Apex Mountain was, Malkovich? I don't know. I'm looking back at his career. I mean, you know, he's obviously one of the great stage directors of all time too. Um Rounders has got to be. Oh, I know what it is. What? It's being John Malkovich. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, you're right. Fuck. They named There's the an movie entire after movie that yeah, is dedicated. Shit. That's like a cherry on the hot fudge Sunday. Yeah. Anybody else for Apex Mountain? Mm, I, what, what do you think about Compliment and Levine? I think Billions is their Apex Mountain. Right now. Yeah. Yeah. Th- their dream in life was to have a show that uh, where. They're at some party and Kevin Durant comes up to them and says they love their show. That's all they ever wanted in life. That's good. Yeah. This is another great category. Who would have been the best ad to this movie? Danny Trejo, Steve Buscemi, or Michael K. Williams? I think the easy, quick answer is Buscemi. Yes. I wouldn't sleep on Michael K. Williams. Not a lot of diversity in this movie, and mm-hmm. he easily could have been thrown in to any poker scene. By the way, it could have also played Grandma. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Could Michael K. Williams have been Worm? Wow, that's... But that goes to like Black Rounders. I, I, knew, the I knew you were going there. I would love Black <laughs> Rounders. Can they make Black Rounders? Sure, let's make Black... The Ringer Films presents Black Rounders. Black Rounders would be incredible. <laughs> Michael K. Williams is Worm. Mm-hmm. Who's Mike McD? Is Michael K. Williams too old to be Worm? Probably. Shit. All right, we, we'll go back to the drawing board on that. So you say Buscemi. I think what you said is right. It's the easy one. You could just see him at that table at the Taj when they're all together. You know, you can see him at the Chesterfield. He just he just fits into this movie. He's a New York guy. Mark Ruffalo's the new for the most overacted scene and or scenes. Grandma's scenes are rough. 
I, I'm not quite sure what to make of grandma. I, I don't like the uh, dog abuse as a dog lover. I don't that like how he treats weird. the pit bulls. Yeah, it's like they, it's a quickie way to make us not like him. Yeah. But it's almost like evil. Yeah. It's like, is this guy evil now? Like, what? And if he is evil, why doesn't he just kill Worm? I'm, I'm a little reluctant to ask this, but what exactly did he even do to the dog? Because the camera cuts away. So like, oh did, yeah, they did. Did yeah. you smack it? Something did he, like, bad. Wh- Something bad happened to the duck. You have another overactor for me. Well, I mean, I think is it possible to be both the they knew to win the they knew award and the heat check award? Because there's like case the KGB. Oh, wow. You're going there. We're doing this now. Is like a little bit of a reach. Two grand. All right, I'll call the two grand. I'll gamble. Don't splash the pot. You're on a draw. Mike, go away. This one is not good for you. And in my club, I will splash the pot whenever the fuck I please. Okay. It's a little bit of a, I'm trying too hard. And it's not because Malkovich isn't captivating. He's fucking captivating in the movie. And everything he says, I laugh at. But I'm not sure if I should be laughing at everything he says. There has to be some menace. There has to be something that scares you about Teddy. And in a lot of ways, he's like, Kind of a oddball, like shut in poker playing, Oreo eating, quasi Russian. And his accent is super weird and exaggerated. And that makes the movie fun, but I'm not sure that it's good. So I had this in Age the Best and forgot to say it before. Teddy KGB's accident, accent, I wrote ridiculous in 1998. I kind of love it in 2018. And I think I'm used to it is why I love it. Yeah. But I I remember in the movie theater, it was the biggest flaw of the movie. It was like, what the fuck is Malkovich doing? What is this accent? It was so over the top. It's such a choice, you know, like it's in a way in a movie that feels like pretty natural. Yeah. He's completely unnatural, but it, I, I'm not even criticizing it. Like I think it works. And it's I fun. say 20 years later, hundred percent works. I actually love it. I like, it's so distinct. It's fun to imitate. Yeah. Very aggressive. <laughs> it's it's almost like a parody of bad Russian accents. I'm actually proud of ourselves that we haven't done too many. That was K- the first one. KGB impressions. Oh, they're coming. Pick a nits. We'll start here. You feeling satisfied now, Teddy? Because I can go on busting you up all night. This is what Teddy KGB says after he takes 60k off somebody who might be like the head of the Russian mafia for all we know. Yeah, I just think he's killed immediately. I don't think he gets out of the Chesterfield at that point. <laughs> you're going to taunt? You're going to taunt the Russian warlord that you just like fucking, you just stole stole a hand from him and took yeah. his money and you're going to fucking dance on his grave? Like, what are you doing, Mike McD? This is a good point. What a heat check. <laughs> All right. I'm laying this down, Teddy. Top two pair. It's a monster hand. I'm going to lay that down. He says that after he finally realizes the Oreo tell. I have two questions about the Oreo tell. It's a controversial moment in the movie. Okay. Question number one. Mike McD is so good at poker, it takes him 14 seconds to read every judge's hand and face at this judge's game. He plays with Teddy KGB for 20 hours. Oreo tell never clicks. Just misses it each time. I don't have a defense. It's the biggest flaw in the movie. Teddy KGB is so good at poker. He's just in the basement cleaning out people. <laughs> Has the most basic tell I've ever seen in my life. Um, if I eat this Oreo, if I don't like my hand, I won't eat it. If I do like my hand, I'll eat it. And just cleans out people for years. It's an interesting choice. I think if the movie was less good or less sophisticated, it wouldn't seem that weird. Because like we were saying at the top of the show, most poker movies are so obvious with everything that they do. Like think of like Casino Royale where like everybody at the table has fucking five kings or whatever. Yeah. This movie is so nuanced and it tries so hard and does so well at showing you what a lot of poker is actually like that this one thing, the tell, which is such an important thing. And they do such a good job in that scene at the Taj with all those guys. Yeah. And they show people like touching their face and tapping the, the their cards and the nervous ticks that they have at the table. Stuff that like I picked up on immediately and try so hard not to do when I play because I'm so mindful of it. The fact that there's one that is so obvious in the villain of the character is just, it, it's just kind of nags at me. I, it, it, on the other hand, I saw this movie in the movie theater they're making it for an audience that doesn't really know poker. 
and it went right over my head. I didn't even realize that till the fourth time I watched it. Really? Yeah. Oh, I see. I remember even specifically at the beginning watching it and being like, oh, he didn't eat the cookie. But you knew more about poker than I did. Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. It, it, it is, I think it is the most criticized thing about the movie, the obviousness of Teddy's tell. And also, you know, <clears throat> I was talking with somebody about this recently. The fact that Mike McD basically tells him he knows his tell in one sense is effective because well, so that that was good. I had that next. Go ahead. Let's let's talk about it. Why does he tell him? So I, I used to for a long time I used to complain about this and I thought it was a problem because he's like, I don't I don't have all night, but like he did have all night. You know, I yeah. it kind of makes no sense. Why if you found out his tell, why don't you just annihilate him on every hand? Yeah. You could probably get his money in like 10 It'd hands. be like Belichick in some football game finding out the tell of some defense. And then just going across the sideline and telling the other coach. Yeah. I it, figured out what you're doing with your cornerback. The 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 counter argument it's here. It's a mind game, right? The counter argument here, which I think is credible and makes sense, and I, I bet this is what they were thinking is, and Mike McTee says, like, he rattled him. He rattled KGB. Even KGB could be rattled. A player as good as him and as intimidating as him. And the minute he's rattled, his game falls apart. He's got no confidence, all that aggressiveness. And so when his game falls apart, Mike can really attack and really get after him. And it's a, I guess it's a calculated choice, but I don't know. I mean, because he says normally I would have gone up busting him all night, but so then he decides to bust him immediately. Like it's one of those things where yeah. if you catch somebody's tell and you can throw them off their game by no telling them that you know their tell. The other thing too is like, show when to show your hand when you're laying something down is a very interesting strategy. And Mike showing Teddy his hand when he lays it down and telling him that he's laying his hand down is one of those things where, like, whenever somebody does that at a table in Vegas when I'm playing, I'm always like, that guy's a fucking idiot. That guy is, like, doesn't have enough security in his game to know that he shouldn't show anybody his hand ever unless you've been playing for 10 hours and you want to show somebody that you actually laid one down and had it. It's a great line. Very good. Laying this down, Teddy. It's a monster. Top two pair. It's a monster hand. I'm going to lay this down. How is Worm not a smoker? <laughs> Has anyone, any movie character ever been a more likely smoker who didn't smoke than Worm? I actually did some research on this. Could have put this in half ass internet research. Decided not to. Saved it for right here. Okay. Ed Norton, anti-smoking. Didn't wow. want the Worm to be a smoker. Didn't want to have smoke cigarettes and all that stuff. Interesting. Doesn't like cigarettes. I think also it works in the plot of the movie because you know he has to play for smokes in, in, in the joint when he's in prison. Right, but doesn't even smoke. So he doesn't smoke. Biggest reach in the movie. Mike McDee's law school professor loans him 10 grand to set up the final scene. The cost is that Mike has to sit through another yeshiva story. I love it, man. Why are you, why are you shitting on Martin Landau? It's 10 grand for one more. When I was in the yeshiva, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I wrote, when I wrote about this movie, I wrote, I actually would have gotten up and been like, you know what? I don't need the 10 grand. I'm just going to rob a liquor store. I can't sit through another yeshiva story. This is going to be, this is kind of bullshitty, but I'm just going to put it out there. Yeah. I think that there's a kind of a weird bond between Irish people and Jewish people. Okay. And I think that there's a Mike McD professor relationship there. The yeshiva thing, that metaphor. There's a kind of like, I don't know. There's like an an underdog thing that that those tribes of people agree on. And that whole storyline makes a lot of sense to me. I grew up with a lot of Jewish guys. I'd like to throw the Italians in there too. Sure, sure. The, the ethnic whites, you know, um, hmm. I don't I like know, just it. something that makes sense there to me. So you like the yeshiva? Do you, I, like, I you like, like it. I, Petrovsky. I, I like the old guy. Yeah, Petrovsky. Yeah. It was funny when he had when he kind of circled back on uh, Entourage, mm-hmm. which had been just dormant of any creativity of anything for like three years, and then the Bob Evans character came back, played by Martin Landau. That's right. But there was like a a, a splash of Petrovsky in him too. <laughs> yeah, just a drop. We should also, we'll never do Crimes and Misdemeanors for the rewatchables unless yeah. it's like season 19. <laughs> but that movie is incredible and he's incredible in it. And One um, of our, for both of our personal favorites. What Crimes a movie that is. All right, another nitpick. We actually have answers for this. Mike McDee starts out the final Teddy KGB showdown, 10 grand. How does he end up with 60? Beats Teddy straight up for the first 20K. Bates him into coming back to the table. Why isn't it just 40K? So Copham and Levine, when I did the Curious Guy with them, they said they made it clear 
and it's subtle, but they made it clear that Teddy KGB reloaded because you see more reload chip things on the thing. Right. And they actually fought for scenes where where they reloaded, but there was like only so far they could go with the minutia of poker before mm-hmm. it actually just became boring. Mm-hmm. It's like, hey, he reloaded. Here's it's like just move the thing along. Makes sense. So sixty K he finally ends up winning. It seems like it should be forty, but it's sixty. There's something weird about Teddy KGB rebuying though. Yeah. You know, buying back into his own like once Mike McDee had forty K, why didn't they just call it a day? Or maybe he was down, maybe he reloaded to double up on a hand or who knows. Yeah. Best quote. What a category this is. This isn't always a great category. I'm going to rip through these. This is beautiful. Welcome to the Chesterfield South. You always told me that this was the rule. Rule number one, throw in your cards when you know you can't win. Fold the hand. Good life advice. Truly. Could be a senior yearbook quote. Another senior yearbook quote. You can't lose what you don't put in the middle, but you can't win much either. I think I said this to John Skipper when I was fighting for more headcounts for Grantland. What happened? So John, we only have 51 headcounts right now. You got sucked out by pocket aces on that one, Bill. I did. <laughs> <laughs> and in my club, I will splash the pot whenever the fuck I please. I can't even do the Teddy KGB. That's a great one. The splash the pot, all of that, the tension. That arguably could have been a what's age the best. Pot splashing. 15 grand in five days. I could do that. I've gone on runs like that before. I love that. The confidence. 15 grand in five days. Don't sleep. I forgot to mention this in the nitpicking. Why isn't Worm playing with them? Why aren't they doubling their chances to make more money? Worm is clearly good at poker. He says, I I, I want to play this straight. But Why? Well, I think he doesn't trust Worm and that ultimately his instincts are right because Worm comes like and Worm sits up. down at the cop game and he gets his right. ass kicked because he's, he's a cheater. If you're too careful, your whole life can become a fucking grind. Another great senior book quote. You keep grinding out that rent money, Joe. It's noble work you're doing. What a cut down that is. It's great. Really enjoy it. Very aggressive. You're a new man and you won't be pushed around. <laughs> Teddy KGB. <laughs> you're really getting all your Makovich in now. Call me if you need a lawyer. I will. And I will. I don't know. I like the ending. Gretchen Mole. You're right, Teddy. That ace didn't help me. I flopped a nut straight. And then I think the best quote of the movie. Hanging around. Hanging around. Hanging around. Kids got alligator blood. I've used that a bunch of times. I just fucking love it. I think that's the best quote in the movie. Boy. I mean, this could be an entire podcast. Plus the other ones we have. Let's go play some fucking cards. We've already did some in there. I think alligator blood is the that's is the prob- one that's lingered. That's pro yeah, hanging around is something that I I'm it's saying. It's a good to football this day. one. It's yeah. like the Pats, the Belichick down ten against Baltimore in the playoffs, alligator blood. Just yeah. kind of transfers to other forms of life. Kids got alligator blood. Can't get rid of him. Probably unanswerable questions. Are we sure Kanish wasn't the smartest of all these people in the hero of it? He owned his own business. He ground he grinded out that rent money. Smart enough not to give Mike McDee 10 grand. He was probably never going to see again. Stayed away from Worm. He, I mean, he also has like one of the great speeches too in the movie when he says. Oh, with with Mike McDee, when Mike McDee tells him about he went head to head with Chan. Yeah, exactly. You went head to head against Johnny Chan. Yeah. When he's in the Turkish bath with him and he tells him yeah. like, it's just, it's not about this. It's not about the World Series of Poker. It's about yeah. making a living, you know, like, I don't know, Kanish, he's, and you get the impression that, you know, Kanish is in the Turkish bath. You get the impression he's actually probably lives okay. He's divorced. He's got alimony. He's got uh, child support and all this stuff, but still. Truck he, business. He doesn't work. He, you know, he owns this truck. He plays cards. It's funny, Mike McDee, and it ends with the Mike McDee going to Vegas to take a, try his hand and maybe play the World Series of Poker. At the time, we didn't really have that much experience with the World Series of Poker. I knew it was happening. You wouldn't have really watched it because you wouldn't have been able to see the cards. And within five years, that became the dream for basically everybody who played poker. Someday I'm going to the World Series of Poker, I'm winning. And the ending makes more, we could have put that in age the best too. The ending makes so much more sense that he's going off to play the World Series of Poker. It's great. If anybody, I, I have to recommend um, Positively Fifth Street to anybody who hasn't read it, who wants to know one. a little bit about the history of the World Series and Binion's Casino. And I think it's- God, that book's like, what, 16, 17 years old now? It's 15 years old now. Yeah. And it's written by a guy named James McManus. And it's one of the great like crime books and also one of the great sports books. And 
really, really good story. And, you know, it's it's full, five full years after this, after Rounders came out. But really we try good. to hire him for Grantland. McManus, yeah. Yeah. He's a great writer. Johnny Chance cameo. Where does it rank in the all-time greatest sports-related cameos? You tell me. The bar is Hulk Hogan in Rocky Three. Is this meaning athletes playing athletes? Or does this include like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in an airplane? You have Kareem in airplane. Xavier McDaniel in singles. Incredible. Love that one. Larry Bird in blue chips. Pretty good. Bob Watson and Cesar Cedeno in Bad News Bears and Breaking Training. <laughs> okay. They literally flipped the pot at the end. Yeah. I think Johnny Chan ranks up there. Whatever else you want to name, he's up there with all of them. I think he got the wrong one in Blue Chips. I think it's Koozie in Blue Chips with the left-handed free throws. But that's not a cameo. He's actually in it. Yeah. He's, he's, he's acting in, two in that. scenes. He's in like, he cries at the end. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> what a, he should have been nominated for an Oscar. What a flex by Koozie. That was amazing. Incredible. Made uh, all the free throws. Chan's out. up there. You know, Chan doesn't actually get to talk. He mouths words. But he Mike McPhee so says cool, the words. He does. He does. I don't hear much about Johnny Chan these days. Yeah. Is this the best gambling movie ever made? Um, it's not my favorite. What's it, your favorite? It's my favorite poker movie. Okay. My favorite gambling movie is California Split, which is a Robert Altman movie from the 70s with George Siegel and Elliot Gould. That is a really good movie about what happens when you make a friend who's a gambler and yeah. how that's bad for you. And I have a friend like the, the one of the guys in California Split and he's mm. bad for me. Yeah. And he, it, it's just a really good movie about friendship and how it gets fucked up sometimes. Rounders, I'm sure, I'm sh- I have no doubt that Compliment and Levine are California split guys. And there's a little bit of Mike McDee and the worm in, in, in those two guys. Um, so, but it, I, I think as far as poker movies go, like Rounders is so head and shoulders above everything else. It's not close. I have like five friends like the California split guy. <laughs> Where do we stand on in the poker game of life? Women are the rake. They're the fucking rake. What are you talking about? What saying? I don't know. There ought to be one. Do you like that? It was iconic 20 years ago. Now now we're in the in the woke era. It's Not, like, ooh, tough, yeah. misogynist. And they, gee, there's all, it hits all these triggers. And I'm like, I, I still like that that was worm saying. You know, here's the thing with like trying to adjudicate the shit. It was this 20 m- years ago. It was 20 years ago. But not just that, but this is a movie about dirtbags. Yeah. Like, well, this is how dirtbags talk. You know, she closed her legs too fast. That's one of worm's great lines in the movie. You know, yeah, so from Chinatown. You know, like- that the, that stuff is just emblematic of, of the way that guys are and whether it's like good or bad i don't know but it's it's not this isn't a movie about the president of the united states it's not a movie about somebody in the, in the navy it's like these are card playing prison dwelling dirtbags where did worm go after binghamton in my 2013 mailbag on grantland i got this question sent it to cop on and levine and they answered it here's what they wrote Worm meant it when he said highway time, but he needed to fill his pockets for the road. He found his way to a backroom game in the Bronx, far away from KGB's territory. Unfortunately, he forgot that he'd heard about this game from the guy he'd fleeced for cigarettes in the Prison Hearts game. (laughs) That guy had been released to saw Worm and chased him halfway across town on foot. We actually shot that scene, edited it, edited it, and screened it too. And it ended up on the cutting room floor. No kidding. Yeah. So that's where Worm went after Binghamton. Okay, I buy it. Um, Here's what they think. This is what they said five years ago, what they think happened with Worm. He took full advantage of all the scamming opportunities presented by the moneymaker online poker boom, Uh joined up with a series of dodgy sites and distant locales, promoted, ripped off, profited like mad. And that's where Rounders 2 will pick up. I like it. Um, One more unanswerable question. Are we sure Meg McDee's girlfriend gave Petrovsky the 10 grand? I thought about this too. Why would Joe do that? How would Petrovsky know? He wouldn't. And also, Mike McDee is like a proven kind of, at least worst case scenario, half scumbag. Let's just go back to Petrovsky giving him the money in the first place. What the hell is he thinking? Ludicrous. A kid who he sees is basically a bad student who doesn't show up on time. It's a terrible Who has a move. gambling problem. Yeah. 10 grand is a lot of money now. Imagine if somebody who, who worked at the ringer who we didn't trust at all, yeah, who like was failing grand. out, asked us for 10 grand. You would never give it to them. Bad. I think, who would it be? Can we go through the entire staff? No, let's, let's maybe off mic. <laughs> 
but it, it is an amazing thing. Like, I, the, if I were Joe, I also wouldn't give it to him. There's a weird thing where Joe has that look at Mike McDee as he's walking away and she's behind the window pane. And she's like, like did like I, they're did gonna I screw have another up? round? Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're going to yeah. go around again. Uh, yeah. But I don't know. We don't, we don't know for sure if Joe did that. What year would have been the perfect year for Rounders to be released? Last unanswerable question. I mean, we talked about this a little bit up top. I think it was no, right on time. Give me an time. actual year. Oh, if it came out like, if it came out like, it's not, it can't be after Moneymaker. It has to be right before Moneymaker. It has to be almost like two weeks before that happened. So the movie is still in theaters and then there's an insane rush of interest in this sport. And, and then, then people happens. start going. Yeah. And then it becomes a huge thing. The problem is Damon and Norton are too old at that point. I actually think for just maybe. the legacy of the movie, it came out at the perfect time. The optimal time for the movie, maybe a year later, mm-hmm. maybe after Fight Club, Damon's got even more of a foothold. Damon's done Talent to Mr. Ripley. They're they're just bigger stars. They've been around a little longer. And then this happens, maybe, but I like how it played out. Yeah, me too. I think it worked out perfectly. I don't know if, if, it, if it had come out any later, I don't know if we'd be doing this podcast. I wrote about uh, what I thought Rounders 2 should be. Okay. This was in 06. I'm just going to read it because I actually thought it was pretty funny that uh, I wrote it during a time when Damon was just an incredible A-plus list success and Affleck was really in a swoon. Okay. So here's what I said. Rounders 2. This is the plot I pitched Koppelman and Levine. Mike McDee, two-time runner-up at the World Series of Poker in 99 and 03, living at the Palms Casino in Vegas, making a living playing in televised tournaments, running his own online website, ripping off celebrities and athletes whenever they come to town. A multimillionaire, a success by any measure. He even hangs out with the Maloofs and Ron Artest. <laughs> he owns a 5% stake in the Kings and dates a former actress played by Heather Graham who gets naked with him in a torrid sex scene in the first 10 minutes. I threw in more sex in Rounders. I see that. Just when he's preparing for the 07 World Series of Poker, Worm shows up in his life again along with Worm's brother, Gerbil, played by Ben Affleck. Gerbil. <laughs> They're in deep trouble. The Russian mob is after them. Being the loyal friend that he is, Mike McDee gets dragged into the situation and ends up having sex with Fam Kate Jansen and her sister, Anna Kornikova, in a torrid three-way to convince Fam Kate to call off the Russian mob. But Fam Kate slips him a drug, and before Mike McDee wakes up, she's transferred $3 million of his money from his computer to Teddy KGB. You're in this movie. You're in so far. Uh, okay. <laughs> it seems very convoluted. Heather Graham walked in during the three-way unbeknownst to Mike McDee and decided to move out. What? Now he's broken single. When he wakes up, KGB tells him, I have your three million. You have to play me for it. I want revenge okay. for the last time we played. Mike McDee, he thinks about it. He goes to Cheater for the next 20 hours, spends his last five grand on a lap dance, Followed by the shocking revelation, Gretchen Mall is working there after getting fired by her law firm. Oh my God. For the Petrovsky thing. Gets her number, but not before she gives him the obligatory, you're wasting your life speech. So she's actually serving some good in Rounders too. Mike McDee goes right to the World Series of Poker with his last 10,000 that he borrows from Petrovsky again. Another 10K. Ends up at the final table with Teddy KGB, Gerbil, and a bunch of other celebs. Gradually knocks everyone out until it's just him and Gerbil setting up the Damon Affleck (laughs) head-to-head scenario everyone's been waiting for. And even though the script, this is what I wrote in 06, even though the script calls for Mike McDee to win, Damon ends up ad-libbing from the script and letting Affleck win because he feels bad about everything that's happened to Affleck since Armageddon. He makes enough second place money, $3 million to replace what he's lost, so he's happy. And the movie ends with a torrid sex scene with Mike McDee and Gretchen Maul, followed by him breaking up with her and telling her that he never liked her in the first place, the end. Rounders two. Thank you. I'm going to applaud myself. Your commitment to insane, impossible, imaginary movies is incredible. Thank you. <laughs> I think a, that's, that's my a best lot one. Of work. <laughs> that's my best one. Ben Affleck is gerbil is, is some of my best work I've ever done. <laughs> I put in four sex scenes. There's a World Series of Poker. There's a climactic showdown with Damon and Affleck. I don't, so let me let me just understand this. Is this the Rounders two you want to happen? That's what I wanted in 06. Okay. Rounders two now, I think is I think Rounders two is just billions. Should we do what hasn't aged well about Rounders two? <laughs> a, lot, <laughs> a lot of it. I think Rounders two is is billion season seven, or maybe season eight. 
It's after after those guys cash in. What, what do you get? Like four four or five years, and then sure. they have to year by year. You just get you're on the Michael Jordan mid nineties Bulls contract. Yes, and they get to the fu point like season eight, and that's when they convinced Damon to come back as Mike McD. He's in 03, started his own poker website. He was the first one there. He became a, a billionaire mm-hmm. um, and now wants to get into the hedge fund thing. Plays Bobby Axe oh. in a high stake poker game and there's some bitterness back and forth and Mike McD decides, I'm starting my own hedge fund. I'm going to fucking take this guy's lunch money. Oh, wow. And so then you, we go. That's season eight. You want the ex- expanded Koppelman Levine universe. You I want, want to bring Mike in McDean the characters. In. Oh. I don't want Rounders 2. I want him in Billy in season eight. Oh, I'm into it. I will say, I feel like there was, there there definitely was a Rounders 2 kind of missed opportunity around 2006, 2007 when poker was pretty big on TV and you could have just had that Damon character. Damon was too popular He was famous. too big. There were probably a million reasons why it could happen. And I think is quirky about it. The really, really like the realistic version of that movie about Mike McD being like the older guy and these like 19 year olds coming in and busting up the games and figuring out new ways to play and spending all day playing online and changing some of the conventions of the game. Like I, I was a, I was a reporter at a magazine in Oh five and I went on a poker cruise to do a story about the poker boom. And so I was on this cruise for like eight days and I spent time with pros and I talked to a lot Sounds of Sounds like when you pitched. I didn't, honestly, it was pitched to me. It's funny, but it did. It got me even more obsessed with the game when I did it. And it was so interesting because I would play at night and I would sit down with these 19-year-old kids. And I was only 23, 24. Right. But I, I would sit down with these 19-year-old kids and they would annihilate me. And they would play in ways that I had never seen before in home games. They were so aggressive. And they were ch- like, all the stuff that Mike McDee is talking about in this movie did not apply to them. And I always <laughs> thought it would have been cool to see his character, who was young but old school, yeah. get kind of challenged by a new generation. I always thought that would have been a fun movie. So he basically, if you assume he goes, I mean, the, the last what if of that movie is what happens when he goes to Vegas? Does he do, do well? You assume like he actually becomes a really good poker player and he's in this Phil Ivey, Daniel Negreanu. Yes. He's in that whole class of guys that kind of rise up and become the new establishment. Yep. And now he has to deal with all these whippersnappers. Yeah, I thought that would have been so interesting. And there's so there were so those guys kind of became famous in a way, and there would have been a lot more cameo opportunities. You could it could have been a great Vegas movie. They talk about Vegas, you know. I think they, I can't remember what casino they say, but the best place place to play in the world is X. But they can only play at the Taj in AC. And you want to see Mike McTee in Vegas? I can't believe Rounders Two can't happen. Why did we create Ringer Films for for no other reason than to make Rounders okay, Two happen? So we're announcing it today. It's you know, a let's go. announce it. I'm just talking those guys and do it. They have a lot of juice right now. They could talk Damon into it. Rounders Two. It's 20 plus years later, and you would think he's just like super wealthy and living in living in Vegas, right? I think if you definitely, I think that would be a, I think that'd be a great entry point. And now Damon is like you know pushing, you have family and 50. kids. Yeah, he's become Kanish, yes. but as like a multi. Whatever, and he's tied to uh, poker websites. Gambling's becoming legal. Yes, I think it would be great. That'd be one way to go. The other way is I. I've always been dying my whole life for the crossover between movies and a TV show or two TV shows where taking a character from one universe. I talked about this on the Rewatchables a couple weeks ago when Salami from The White Shadow showed up on Saint Elsewhere, but Coolidge was the janitor. And they had to pretend, and one guy thought he knew, and but like I always thought that could have worked. Yes. Take the character and put him in. They basically did this with Teddy KGB and Billions last year. They, they, it's been, it's essentially the same character. He's just a hedge fund guy. I'm saying take Mike McD and you're moving him in. What if it was Worm who infiltrated Worm's Billions dead? Season? Worm's not alive. Oh man, all right, Worm's not alive. That's sad. Worm's not around. All right, last question: Who won the movie? I think it's Malkovich. Wow, I wasn't expecting that. Because Malkovich's character is the most memorable. He is the most quoted. He is the person who I think people still are using as like the f- the phrasing in uh, at tables to this day. Now, it's not Damon's biggest movie. It's not Norton's biggest movie. In many ways, it was not a financial hit. It's it's not necessarily what John Dahl is best remembered for. Compliment and Levine, obviously, have they go on to a lot. It's Famke Jansen was about to be an X Men. You know, John Turturro has been in bigger movies. Like, but for Malkovich, for I think especially for men of a certain couple of generations, this is the one where we were just like, Malkovich is fucking crazy, man. He's awesome. Like, he, yeah. he doesn't give a shit. He's just gonna go for it. 
So I'm going Malkovich. Strong case. I'm going Damon because I think this is like an old school Tom Cruise role. Mm -hmm. Color where, money. Where it's just like, you just need a star. There's not really a lot going on with the part other than the dialogue's really good. But yep. if you're like, all right, describe Mike McD to me. Hmm. Um, he's in law school, but he's not a very good law student. And he's friends with somebody he should be friends with. And he likes poker. That's really it. Yep. Somehow makes me really care about the guy. I, I don't know how many guys pull it off. If we just go through and you just put all the guys from the 90s in that role, it's like, is this movie as good with Ben Affleck? No. Is this movie as good with Leo? No. Brad Pitt? No. Like, just go through everybody. George Clooney? No, too old. Like, however you want to play it, he's the only guy who pulls that that character off. I think Ed Norton could have done it. Is the, ironically the only other choice. I buy that. I buy that. I guess I just think that Damon was going to be fine no matter what. And, yeah. and because it's a movie star part, there's something inherently like blank about his character. Even if you feel like he's real, he's never going to go too far, too crazy or be too good. You know, yeah. he always has to be somewhere in the middle. So, but I, I think that's a really good case. And obviously he goes on to be like one of the five biggest movie stars. I mean, you ever. could argue Koppelman and Levine win the movie because how many like TV slash movie writers do we even know? It's true. I mean, and they, 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 they basically they just got knock profiles. around guys off of this, right? Yeah, but then it led to a whole bunch of stuff. They've been in profile. They've had, they've done 30 for 30s. But like in that world, how many do we know? We know Steve Zalian. Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of the people who do well, that you stuff. know them. Yeah, I'm saying yeah. like how many normal people know who wrote a movie or who wrote a TV show or who runs it? Like even like a, sh a succession, a show that we like. Yep. I can't remember the guy's name who does that. It's Jesse something. Jesse Armstrong. Jesse Armstrong. I don't know what he is. I don't know anything about him. He's a brilliant British TV writer. But yeah, you're right. I mean, he doesn't have the public profile. I mean, you know, some of that stuff is self-created. Some of that stuff is like... Who's the guy who does Veep? Uh, it used to be Armando Iannucci. And now, right. and now it's who Jesse Armstrong worked for. And now it's David Mandel, who worked on Seinfeld and Curb and a bunch of other shows. I know all these people because I'm obsessed with this stuff. But most, most people, people don't. don't. You're right. And Coppelman and Levine did a nice job of positioning themselves in this whole guy's pop culture world that had yeah. really started in the late nineties. And there was this whole run of guys being guys and people who idolized double down Trent. And you know, you're probably the right. I wrote about my column. It's pro it's, it's probably Koppelman and Levine. Cause they, they have like thriving careers and, and this is a thing. It's so hard to make something that people actually love and people like me and you actually love this movie. Yeah. The, the only thing Damon loses it initially but then I think retroactively you look at those three in a row that he had and it's like all timer. It was a really like Goodwill hunting Ripley rounders. It's just fucking looks great out an IMDb. I think the best rewatchables are the movies when most of the major players are in their sweet spot. Yeah. And, and Damon and Norton, no doubt are in their sweet spot during this time. Anything else? This is great. I fucking rounders. love rounders. Want to go play some poker? Let's go. <laughs> Thanks to Lisa. Remember, they have 30 years of experience in mattress engineering. 300,000 happy Lisa sleepers agree. Their Lisa mattress gives them the rest they need. Order yours online right now. Lisa.com slash rewatchables with promo code rewatchables. Try it risk-free for 100 nights. Ships direct to your door. Convenient box. Free shipping. Free returns. Get up to $160 off the Lisa mattress or $235 off the luxury Superior mattress with free shipping at Lisa dot com slash rewatchables enter promo code rewatchables l-e-e-s-a lisa.com slash rewatchables